So thanks a lot, Ayan, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. I will present, as you mentioned, uh, the work that I've been doing at the Godfrey Technique. Uh, this work has been done together with my advisors, Francesco Sotil and Matteo Gatti. Uh, so I will be talking about excitons, and in particular, how can we uh, measure them or study them uh, through this technique called resonant inelastic X-ray scattering. And I will show some results that we have um, uh, observed and, is, and we have done on aluminum oxide. So can can you see uh, my mouse? If I, so, if I point, so yes, no. Yeah, yeah, we can see on your okay. your pointer. So let me first start by introducing what is a resonant inelastic X-ray scattering. So in this technique, in this scattering technique, we have that an incoming X-ray photon will be scattered through a sample. And uh, by controlling uh, the energy and the momentum of this uh, incoming photon, and by measuring uh, the energy and the momentum of the emitted photon, uh, we can get information of the electronic structure of our sample. So it is important to, to highlight that with this technique, uh, we will be, uh, uh, it will be uh, dependent on the polarization. So by changing the angle of the sample, we can change the polarization of the incoming. And, and it also depends on the polarization of the going photo. And since we uh, are working in the X-ray regime, uh, it could be soft or hard X-rays, uh, this technique provides uh, bulk information because these uh, rays can, uh, ray can penetrate uh, quite uh, deep in the sample. And uh, because uh, uh, it is an elastic scattering, uh, there is some um, uh, transfer of energy from, uh, from the incoming photon to the sample. And of course, there is uh, the conservation of the energy and the momentum in the whole process. Uh, the most important thing and property of RIGS, and what it, I think it makes it more uh, interesting, is the possibility to, to be element and orbital specific. Because since it is uh, resonant, this means that we will uh, tune the energy of the incoming uh, photon to a specific state that we want to study. Uh, so, so normally, because of this reason, we perform these experiments in synchrotron facilities where we can have access to uh, to uh, above the spectrum of wavelengths and uh, energies, and also we can provide uh, quite high intensities that we need to in order to to observe uh, uh, the photons that are scattered. So. Uh, I wanted to explain also which kind of information we can uh, obtain from RIGS and how do I uh, RIGS spectra looks like. So uh, in a, normally in RIGS we plot uh, the intensity or the accumulated photons that we uh, we measure as a function of the energy loss. So uh, you can if you can resolve uh, low energy excitations. You could, for example, measure phonons or magnons, and the traditional, uh, well, the most uh, most of the cases, the, the RIGS is performed uh, to study electronic excitations, such as, for example, DD transitions and other kind of electronic excitations. And this is where I'm, I will focus on in this presentation. And in particular, I would like to uh, put some emphasis on what is the role of excitonic effects uh, during uh, this process. Uh, so in order to understand why exotonic effects might be important in the RIGS process, let me now explain uh, in more detail uh, what is happening inside the sample when we perform the experiment. So uh, as I mentioned before, we will uh, tune the energy of the incoming photon to a specific state that we want to study in our sample. Uh, so I call it mu. And we will uh, therefore excite it uh, to a conduction state and we will create this intermediate state with a core hole that is uh, very unstable, so it has a very short lifetime. As a result, uh, there will be a relaxation of uh, the um, valence uh, electron to fill this core hole and we end up in a final state, which is also exci excited state. 
So uh, what? Well, this is direct rig, so we don't we we are uh, we are considering just a direct uh, uh, example here. And uh, what is important uh, to notice that we will have an electron hole pair in the intermediate and in the final state. So even though in the intermediate state is a virtual state, very short lifetime. Uh, the, um, the presence of, uh, of the electron uh, hole pair and the interaction of, of these, uh, these two particles could be uh, very important and to determine the, the final state and uh, also to reproduce properly experiments. So uh, in the experimental side and also in the theory side, what has been done so far? Here I show you uh, some RIGS results that have been done with two different codes, uh, ocean and exciting, and they both compare uh, the results with experiments in the case of lithium fluoride. So uh, in this in this case, uh, the, the experiment is in dotted line, and in this case is in black. Uh, this, in this case, uh, the experiment, the calculations has been done Without including the core hole effect, this means uh, the electron hole interaction in the intermediate state only, and including uh, this uh, this core hole effect. So of course here you see there is a quite good agreement with experiments when you include this uh, this uh, intermediate uh, uh, intermediate electron hole interaction electron hole interaction in the intermediate state. Uh, and the, on the other hand, uh, same similar results are observed in uh, when you calculate the beta Peter equation to um, to capture excitonic effects in the intermediate and in the final state, or if you perform independent particle uh, calculations where you don't consider um, electron hole interaction at all in the whole uh, Riggs process. So again. There is uh, an, uh, uh, an agreement uh, in the case of the beta Peter, especially at the, at the peak, at the energy of the peak. So now um, what we would like to do is to, instead of use all electron codes uh, to such as ocean or exciting, is uh, to perform or implement uh, the same uh, Riggs studies in cell potential codes. And why do we want to do that? So uh, there are two uh, two important reasons why we would like to to explore uh, the, the the calculation of rigs from from pseudo potentials. The first one is that uh, when we use all electron calculations, uh, we have to define uh, an atom where we will uh, uh, excite uh, the. Uh, the core electron. So this means that we will be localizing the core uh, the core hole in a specific atomic site and this will uh, this will uh, uh, prevent us from describing uh, an imp important effect such as interference that might occur uh, if you excite several uh, um, equivalent atoms uh, or degenerate uh, uh, equivalent atoms or degenerate states in the same um, uh, in this in the same process and the second reason uh, that uh, is, is even more important is that not all the core states can be studied with all electron approach. And this is because uh, the all electron calculations use a muffin team and uh, they consider uh, the excitation contained inside the muffin team, the, the core hole inside the muffin team. So um, if, the, if you want to study, for example, a shallow core, uh, a shallow, um, uh, core uh, excitation, where the energies are not that deep and the states are not very localized, then uh, the state is not going to be fully contained inside the muffin tin, and therefore you cannot uh, perform a, a Riggs study on these states. This is, for example, the case of the L23 uh, edge in aluminum, which corresponds to excitations from the 2p states to the, to the conduction band. And, and the last uh, interesting point for us is that we could therefore treat a valent core state with the same footing. So by just um, develop uh, by uh, setting up a pseudo potential that uh, that doesn't contain uh, those uh, shallow core states inside. So therefore, we will be uh, calculating the, them with a plane wave with plane waves. 
uh, we, we can treat these shallow core states and also the balanced states with both with plane waves. And uh, during this presentation, I would like to specifically address the following questions regarding to, to the studies that we, ha uh, we have done in, in, this, in this time uh, at the corporate technique. So uh, the first one is that if we uh, do a measurement, a rigs measurement, and or if you calculate rigs, which kind of information can we get from it concerning electronic excitations? Uh, and uh, how can we analyze the risk spectrum? And the second question is if, if we can uh, perform uh, also accurate uh, calculations of risks using absolute potential code. So in order to answer to these questions, I will first discuss uh, the risk intensity of risk cross-section at the aluminum L1 edge in aluminum oxide. And I use this material because it is a, a wide band gap insulator where we expect uh, the exotonic effects to be important and therefore we can um, study and analyze uh, the role of, of them. And in the second place, uh, we will um, uh, compare uh, X-ray absorption uh, calculations and Briggs calculations at the aluminum L1 edge calculated with all electrons and also with a cell potential code to, to, to verify whether uh, the results are accurate. We will take as a benchmark the all electron code, of course, and we will benchmark um, uh, against uh, so, uh, using an um, all electron and we will match the cell potential uh, calculations. So uh, before going to results, let me first uh, detail what is the methodology that uh, we have been using? Uh, we uh, we want to describe excitons. So the state of the art technique uh, to do this is the beta sub beta equation that um, that we can express at this uh, as uh, this Asian um, Asian value problems where we uh, can diagonalize uh, this Hamiltonian and obtain uh, the Asian vectors and the Asian values. The, and these are ex, the exotonic eigen values because they will correspond to the um, uh, excitation energies, um, including exotonic effects. Uh, in the Hamiltonian, um, we can express it as a sum of, uh, of these terms, where we have uh, the diagonal, the diagonal uh, corresponding to the independent particle um, energies. This means the energies of the uh, uh, conduction states and the valence states without including any interaction. Uh, yes. Ah. Uh, and uh, also we we have uh, the, the uh, Coulomb interaction that will give um, the local field effects that is, um, th these effects uh, are given by the fact that when we apply an external field, then the system will react and we induce a, a field that in the case of inhomogeneous systems and also polar quite polarizable uh, systems, it could be important and it will give uh, contributions. And finally, we have the screen Coulomb interaction that accounts for the interaction between the electron and the hole. By the way, uh, during the talk, I will refer as independent particle, uh, IPA, uh, independent particle calculations, LPA, um, cal um, calculations that include the independent particle term plus uh, the Coulomb term and the beta sub beta, uh, the calculations that are performed by, by using the, the full uh, Hamiltonian. On the other hand, uh, if you want to describe Riggs, basically, uh, we have to uh, uh, we have to to be to be uh, to describe the Kramers Heisenberg formula that is uh, this complicated equation that you can see here. In order to understand uh, what it represents, uh, here I put again the scheme that I showed before. So here you have the initial, uh, the intermediate, and the final states. And um, so we have the transition uh, operators. 
in this case, depending on the polarization, uh, on the the trans uh, dipole uh, and uh, uh, transitions, uh, and uh, and in the denominator, and here k k two and k one represents the the k uh, the k of the uh, incoming and the outgoing photons. The denominator of the equation here represents the conservation of the energy in the intermediate, uh, in the intermediate uh, state. This means the absorption process. Or, and uh, in here in the right, you can see the overall conservation of the energy, where uh, the energy loss defined as the difference between the incoming and outgoing photon uh, must be equal to the, uh, the energy of the initial uh, minus the final state. Sorry, the final minus the initial state. So uh, we, of course, we cannot solve this uh, because here we have the uh, many body inter uh, final, intermediate, and, and initial states. So we should represent uh, this equation in a, in another way, where we can uh, replace it by some ingredients that we can obtain, for example, from the solution of the Vitas Arpital equation. And this is what I show here. Of course, it is a quite a long <laughs> mathematical development to get to uh, the final equation. But I would like to highlight, uh, highlight this uh, intermediate step, a step where we here arrive to uh, an equation where we have expressed the intensity of the rigs as a function of the polarizability of, uh, that we could calculate uh, from uh, the excitation of a core uh, state to the conduction band. Uh, and uh, polarizability that we obtain from, uh, the, from the calculation from a valence to a conduction band. And then we also ha have, again, the uh, polarization vector and the dipole matrix elements, uh, because we have uh, uh, used the dipole approximation. And also here, I also apply the Tandamkov uh, approximation. So if we replace uh, the polarizability, uh, in this case, I use these general indexes to refer that we can uh, uh, calculate it for a core conduction or a valence conduction transitions. Uh, as a, uh, we, we can express it as a function of the Eichen vectors and the energies, excitation energies, that we obtain when we diagonalize the Hamiltonian that uh, I explained before. And uh, finally, uh, if we replace this equation and we uh, resolve the, the clean a bit <laughs> more the, the total expression, we can arrive to uh, this um, cross section or the intensity for rigs where we have here on one side, uh, well, the oscillator strength will depend as before on the um, incoming energy of the photon. And uh, we have uh, two terms here, uh, the um, two factors here, uh, the, the probability of the, of the X-ray absorption. This is quite similar to what we calculate when we do X-ray absorption. And on the other hand, you have uh, these other um, objects that are given, that will describe the, um, let's say, the excitation pathways because it uh, somehow connect uh, di uh, dipole matrix elements that goes from valence to core with um, eigenvectors of calculations that are uh, from uh, um, core to conduction and from valence to conduction. And we have here uh, the conservation of the energy in the, in the complete process. And this is uh, the spectrum that we obtain as a result in the case. Well, this is the K edge, or, I mean, this is the L1 edge, uh, but uh, the spectrum is um, very much the same as the L1 edge. But uh, the, the energies are corresponding to the L1 edge. So uh, what have, uh, have I plotted here is the energy loss uh, that I referred before as the energy of the incoming uh, minus the outgoing photon. And here we have um, the X-ray absorption um, spectra because uh, it is always helpful when we either when we calculate it or when, when we do experiment to to have this reference to see 
that at each energy that we are exciting, where in the X-ray absorption uh, we are. And especially because the behavior is uh, quite different if we are exciting uh, in this region or if we are exciting in this region. So uh, we can uh, identify two different kinds of features in this spectrum. On one side, we have here um, a, what we call a Raman features because appear at a constant energy loss. And uh, these Raman features are, uh, I would say, the most important one in Riggs because they depend strongly on the incoming photon. So um, this highlights somehow uh, the coherence or the coupling that we have in this technique between the absorption and the emission. So um, as a result, you see that the curve uh, changes the shape uh, with, the, with the, the incoming energy, when you change the incoming energy, but also um, the, the peaks remains at the, the same um, energy loss. On the other hand, we also observed uh, fluorescence features that appear usually when we, you excite at energies uh, much higher uh, than, or higher than the X-ray absorption threshold. And in this case, uh, the, the peaks move together um, to move, uh, let's say, the, the appear at increasing energy loss, which means that it is actually constant emission because you will increase the absorption and then um, you keep constant emission. So therefore you uh, increase uh, the, the energy loss. And these features uh, are normally associated to just X-ray emission or fluorescence because uh, this means that you have lost uh, the coherence or the coupling between absorption and emission and just the absorption will give you um, a modulation of the intensity, uh, but won't change the shape of the spectrum. So uh, sometimes because of uh, the nature of, of these two different features, we analyze them separately. And here I will describe briefly how we can uh, compare them to other uh, spectrum, uh, other spectrum that we obtain, for example, with uh, non-resonant rigs. So uh, here again, I show uh, the question that we uh, arrived before for the rigs, and uh, we compare uh, the energy, the the, the rigs losses with uh, the losses that, for example, we can compute with non-resonant rigs, or um, non-resonant X, let's say, non-resonant elastic X-ray excitatory, X scattering. So um, in this case, um, we are uh, we are getting information in, in non-resonant non rigs. X, we are getting information on the structure factor, which is uh, proportional to uh, the imaginary part of uh, of epsilon, the, the electric uh, function, uh, macro, the macroscopic electric function, uh, the inverse, let's say. So uh, by comparing uh, the two equations, we would expect that the peaks that we measure or calculate uh, with these two methods appear at the same energy. However, uh, if you see here the oscillator strength or the intensity given by this, um, part uh, here of the equation, and in this case, uh, in, in, in a non-resonant uh, X, are uh, very different. And they follow different selection rules because in one case, we have the coupling between uh, two processes, uh, absorption and emission. And in this case, uh, you will have just a scattering process that as a result give you a valence uh, excitation, which is equivalent to the final state in rigs. But the, the, the way that you arrive to this final state is completely different, and therefore uh, the selection rules are different, and this is reflected here, and the, we see that some peaks appear uh, in the structure factor, and uh, we don't see them in the, in the rigs spectrum. And this is, uh, we associate this uh, to the fact that when we excite from the L1 edge, this means that we are exciting from 
two S states of aluminum to the bottom of the conduction band, which has mostly S character. So uh, in this case, this transition uh, is forbidden. So um, uh, the, the minimum uh, energy peak that we will see uh, around these energies, we don't see it uh, in rigs uh, because uh, this uh, first step uh, absorption in rigs is forbidden. On the other hand, uh, when you have, uh, for example, um, the excitations from the top of the valence bands to the bottom of the conduction band, the top of the valence band is mostly P character and the bottom of the conduction band is S character, so you will have this uh, uh, transition allowed. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we can uh, compare uh, also um, the the fluorescence features to the X-ray emission. As I mentioned before, uh, since uh, this is uh, mostly uh, uh, fluorescence, meaning uh, that we have um, we have the peaks at um, a, at a, a constant emission energy, as as you can see here. And uh, the important thing here, I also plotted uh, the independent particle uh, results in um, in green. And in in the case of uh, of the low energy, uh, when we are exciting at the threshold, we see that um, the, the below the threshold or the threshold, we see that the independent particle uh, calculations actually give quite different results. They don't um, they don't reproduce uh, very well uh, the the, the risks that we obtain with uh, with the beta beta. So this means that including the excitonic effects is uh, mainly important when we want to describe um, uh, the risks features. Sorry, uh, the Raman features. Okay, so this was a uh, concern, the first question that we wanted to answer. And now uh, the second question is if we could um, use the zero potential, um, a zero potential code to, to calculate the risks. And um, before uh, studying directly risks, we have to uh, also compare the results uh, in the case of X-ray absorption, because we know that the absorption uh, can be understood, understood as an uh, intermediate state uh, of rigs. So, uh, and it's also the most delicate uh, point because um, the X-ray uh, the X-ray absorption, and these are give here two uh, examples, L23 and the L1. Uh, we we have to go high in energy, and uh, we are really uh, have to test that so potentials. Uh, we have well converged with the plane waves, and even so, if the so potentials give a good a good description of, of these excitations. So um, in the L two three case, we will have excitations from the two p states to the conduction band and in aluminum, and the L one from the two s states to the conduction band. And uh, I show results for an electron in red and in, um, sorry, in an electron in blue and independent, um, and uh, in, um, in, uh, in red, the so potential results. Uh, the most uh, similar uh, spectrum are found, let's say, for, uh, for the L23H in the three cases, uh, independent particle, LPA, and beta sulpeter. And uh, in the case of the L1H, we have uh, small differences, uh, especially in the absorption intensity, because as I mentioned in, at the beginning, uh, when we do our electron calculations, we just perform an excitation from one of the atoms. So then if we want to contrast with the potential where you have four degenerated uh, uh, states that you have to consider them all, uh, you have to multiply by four, but this is not exactly um, it doesn't recover exactly the same intensity. This means that there might be some interference effect um, that are present in the zero potential case that gives uh, a reduction in the intensity. <clears throat> so, um, 
So uh, one last uh, step will be uh, to calculate the risk spectrum with the pseudo potential. And these are preliminary results that we have obtained recently. Uh, again, we have the energy loss uh, for different uh, uh, and the absorption and the risks for different uh, incoming uh, photon energies. And uh, I plotted here in blue uh, the potential results and in orange uh, the all electron results. So uh, if you see the peaks um, follow uh, the, uh, different energies, you see them that they follow the follow the the, the same uh, energy loss. However, the intensities might vary quite a lot, and this might be we have to do further studies. But this might be related to the fact that we are again uh, having four states in the potential case, and um, this implies that we have more transitions uh, that can. Um, uh, when you sum all the transitions, uh, you can have uh, that uh, gives um, different interference, let's say. So uh, at the end, uh, we we have uh, the, um, the peaks uh, that doesn't follow the same uh, intensities. Uh, notice that here, we are, in all the cases, we are uh, normalizing by the maximum uh, in each case. So, uh, the, the densities may also vary if you take the absolute uh, values. So finally, some conclusions. So uh, we have observed that uh, for energies that are close to X -ray, to the X-ray absorption onset, uh, the Riggs spectra showed a Raman uh, behavior. And uh, this means that the losses remained uh, constant uh, uh, when the incident photon uh, energy was fired. And on the other hand, we also say that, that uh, at higher energies uh, be beyond the X uh, ray absorption uh, threshold, the rigs uh, can be uh, seen as a two-step fluorescence behavior where um, we have lost the coherence between the absorption and the emission process and therefore, uh, we see uh, that the features move with the with the incoming photon energy. And uh, finally, we also have uh, show that um, uh, we have to uh, we have uh, clear uh, differences when we include and when we ignore uh, the electron hole interactions in both intermediate and in the final state. And um, that if we want to, in the, regarding the pseudo potential implementation, uh, we have already obtained a good description of the X-ray absorption with pseudo potentials, which is already a big step. But now, um, well, regarding the rigs, um, we have observing some small differences. And this might be related, again, to the fact that uh, there are interference when we consider all the atoms in the system. So finally, some outlook. Uh, so we have performed uh, measurements of rigs on boron nitride at the Fermi uh, free electron uh, energy um, laser uh, and the line magnetine. And we have to analyze the results and uh, see if we can see uh, some dynamics of, uh, of the exciton uh, in, in, uh, in boron nitride. And something I forgot to mention is that we have already performed uh, measurements on aluminum at the L edges, but they weren't very successful uh, since we observe mostly photoluminescence. So this is something that uh, sometimes we can calculate the spectrum, but then it's much easier because then in, in, in the experiment, you have a lot of other uh, variables that you have to, uh, to consider. And in this case, uh, uh, we observe photoluminescence um, so we should repeat uh, these measurements to uh, using some filter to, uh, to see if we can reduce this and we can see actually the rigs uh, at the L23 and the L1 edge. And uh, well, finally, um, <laughs> currently, if you uh, if you are familiarized uh, with the beta sulfitar equations, you, you, you realize that these are quite uh, heavy calculations. So, um, Optimizing and para having a good parallelization of the call to do this as fast as possible is, criti is critical, especially if you have to solve uh, two bit of equation in order to get uh, one Riggs spectrum. 
So now I will be uh, working on the, uh, in, in improving this uh, uh, this implementation by uh, improving the parallelization, let's say, and uh, seeing if it's possible to implement uh, one scheme that's been already done in exciting, uh, which consists uh, in interpolating the, um, the density and uh, actually the, the Hamiltonian. So I wanted to thank you for your attention. And I wanted to thank uh, the codes for, well, I use uh, open source codes. I wanted to thank, uh, thank also the, um, uh, the funding that I received for, for my postdoc fellowship in the first uh, two years and also the institutions. Thank you very much, uh, Laura, for this nice talk. Uh, so there's uh, time for questions now. So if you have a questions, if you have a question, please raise your uh, hand in the reaction section. Okay, okay, we see them live because you, <laughs> we see your Zoom. Uh, so uh, Lorenzo, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, congratulations for the work. Um, <clears throat> so I have a, a question that may trigger a second question. Mm -hmm. uh, is about uh, the pseudo potentials that you use. Um, Maybe you said it and I, got, I lost it, but how technically you include the core hole? Are, are, are really different pseudo potential with this explicit core hole or you do something else? No, uh, so uh, sometimes uh, when there are so potential calculations, uh, on uh, on rigs uh, before well I don't think if it I don't know if they are still using this technique but uh, they used to prepare a special so potential as you mentioned with a hole and then uh, they use this special so potential for one of the atom and then they perform on top of that the beta circuiter but in our case um, our so potentials are simply so potentials that don't contain uh, the states that we want to study. So this means that if we want to study the aluminum L1 and L23, this means the 2S state and the 2P states of aluminum are not inside the so potential. So we treat them, um, uh, we treat them explicitly with plane waves. And we do a beta Peter calculation as you would do a beta Peter for valence. Uh, electrons, but in this case, uh, with these uh, uh, deep uh, uh, deep energy electrons. Mm. Uh, I think I understood. So it's not explicit, explicit in the pseudo potential itself. But mm -hmm. anyway, uh, you should be able, maybe, if I'm not wrong, you should be able to uh, enable this uh, this calculation only for specific atoms. I think uh, I think of it. Um, because you said that the discrepancies, uh, like here, the discrepancies you see with uh, all electron codes and yours are maybe due to the fact that in all electron codes, the the hole is localized on a specific atom. So I was wondering if you can check uh, this uh, assertion by by enabling your, uh, your pseudo potential calculation only for one atom out of four and leave like a standard method for the other three. So uh, the thing that we when we describe um, uh, with uh, the, the excitations with the plane wave, so we get if we are studying the two S states, four bands corresponding to the four aluminum atoms, and they are degenerated. And uh, the result of the spectrum is wrong if you if you include just one uh, of these bands or two of these bands. Mm. So uh, actually, in this, I don't know if uh, the system, if other states much more, much deeper, that could be possible. But in this case, that the energies are not very deep, uh, you have to include the four uh, bands supported by the four uh, aluminum atoms. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. It's also a limitation of the potentials. Let's say if you want to do just uh, one atom, then uh, mm -hmm. uh, you have to make sure. Okay. Can I can I comment on that? Yes. Uh, sure, sure, Francisco. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, maybe I got another um, uh, view of what Lorenzo asked. Mm -hmm. Because if I understood correctly, Lorenzo suggests something like: I have two aluminum atoms in my cell, and I treat them differently. 
exactly. I treat one aluminum atom with the with the method that we do. So with the pseudo potential that contains the two S and two P in balance. So oh, okay. And another aluminum atom in which uh, it will be without any. So it will be two different species. Yes, basically. And in that case, yeah. the core states will be only coming from one atom. Is that your question, Lorenzo? Yes, yes, exactly. That's a good point that could be tried. However, as you see there in the difference is really small, really, really small. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if it are actually this difference in treating them, two species in a different way, so different cutoff, it will be or on the same order or bigger. But uh, yes, in principle, this could be a possibility to have only one atom in uh, uh, where we create the the excitations. Hmm. Okay. Uh, just since you you mentioned it, it means by the way that your your pseudo, the point, the pseudo potentials you use for these calculations require a higher cutoff because the much faster varying plane waves or not. Much higher, so much higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. On the order of uh, two thousand electron volts. Yeah, it was what I expected. Okay, no, it's it's horrible. It's <laughs> okay. Thank and you. This, yeah, so uh, yes, uh, a bottleneck in the sense that it takes uh, makes the calculation quite heavy. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Thank you very much. Very good work. Well, thanks a lot for your question. Okay, thanks, Lorenzo. Uh, there's a question from Michael. Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, wait a moment. Uh, a problem with the audio. audio. Mm. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. So first, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, my question is related to the L23 edge. Um, how are you treating the um, spin uh, spin orbit splitting? Uh, are you treating explicitly using uh, relativistic uh, fully relativistic pseudo potentials, or um, so? Is, this is the question uh, for uh, the yeah. two three edge. Yes, unfortunately, uh, we we are we don't have an implementation to treat. Uh, explicitly the L23 splitting. And this is not very, I mean, it's 0 0.5 uh, electron volts in the um, in this case. Uh, so that this as a result gives that uh, the exciton, this peak, uh, is actually double peak uh, separately by this, this is small the energy. But the rest of the energies, uh, the rest of the peaks are quite well described with uh, with our cell potentials. But yes, that's something that we haven't uh, done so far, in, in, especially because uh, it is not uh, implemented. No, I just, just an idea could be to um, uh, just compute L, L, L2 and use the, the experimental uh, splitting and get the L3 uh, using the region of it. But yeah, it's, it will be more complicated to use explicitly the the fully relativistic uh, pseudo potential. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, so you're doing the, the experiments yourself on this um... All these materials oh. to compare, or I mean, you you're waiting for the experimenters to do the to obtain the measurements. But um, are there maybe other materials for which there is a rig spectra available to which you could compare, or are those calculations too expensive? Is, uh, is there... I'm sorry. No, I just wonder if there's some uh, some material to which you compare uh, to uh, for which you can do the calculations and for which there is experimental data available. Uh, yes, so on, on one side, uh, no, it's not. So I, I participate from the experiments, but uh, in fact, uh, the experiments have been conducted uh, in the case of uh, the aluminum oxide in, in Soleil. Uh, so we did it together in collaboration with Alessandro Nicolau, who is uh, uh, well, the, one of the uh, main researchers of uh, the line sextants. And they did uh, most, of course, of the uh, of the experiment because uh, I have not uh, I am not familiarized on how to uh, how to do it, uh, so we participated from the discussions. 
And uh, on the other hand, um, well, um, and also we uh, we are a team. We were a team that also did experiments in, in um, boronitride in Fermi. It also again together with experimentalists that they have more clear uh, uh, experiment on one side on rigs and also in time resolve rigs so again with uh, Alessandro Nicolau and Marco Malesturbo Malestu Malestubo, I, I didn't mention his names. Um, so uh, and the second question regarding other uh, the possibility of uh, performing other calculations and in fact comparing. Um, so we started with the minimum oxide because um, it was uh, something that we didn't know that we wouldn't be able to measure at the moment. So we just found out last week, and now uh, we are we will we will see if it's possible to measure. We'll try again, or we we could test uh, with other materials. But when we chose the material to do all the studies, uh, we we were quite optimistic that it will be possible to to measure. Okay, but in the literature, there, there must be some ex uh, yes. experimental data on other materials. Uh, but yeah. so I guess, you, I mean, your calculations, but, of course, are, are very expensive. So I don't know how easy it is to... In fact, here I show lithium fluoride, but uh, you can find uh, cuprates, a lot of uh, rigs experiments done on cuprates and other um, uh, uh, so other much more complex materials. Uh, it's not very frequent that they do experiments on simple materials so also it's um if, if you want to choose a material to do the calculations you have uh all limitations that we have with the dft and so on so we and also the number of atoms that you can include and you cannot afford to reproduce any <laughs> experiment uh, that they survival uh, so, so these are rig spectras uh these are experimental spectras and the, the calculations the, also, but so did you try to compare to the, I guess, excited, so these are all electron calculations, did you do also the, uh, you get similar results for the pseudo-potential uh, results? With so potential, uh, no, but actually, if you see here, uh, these are being done for the KH, so these energies are um, much uh, out of uh, the range of energies that we can access with the, with the sub-potential formalism. Okay. Yeah. We can we can describe excitations with the potentials at up to one hundred fifty. Well, we have one hundred fifty two. I don't know. I I could say two hundred. Uh, but I don't. I don't, We cannot access definitely these energies, and I don't. I don't think that we can go much beyond that. Yeah. Of course. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. There's a question from uh, Nicola. Thank you. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so uh, just a curiosity, can you do D to D transition or uh, say, do you include uh, the finite moment of the photon here or not? No, um, so let's, let's look at this. So um, in the questions, or the momentum, we we do dipole approximation, so we don't consider the momentum of the uh, in, we don't consider neither the momentum of the incoming uh, nor the outgoing photon. So okay. uh, everything is treated on the dipole. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Nicola. Uh, any other questions? Last chance. Okay, I don't see any further questions. So it's almost three o'clock. So maybe it's a good time to stop. So thank you again, uh, Laura, for the for the nice talk and everybody for the discussion. And hopefully see you see you next time. Okay, thanks a lot for for giving me the opportunity to present the, the work. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, bye. bye. See you. Bye. -bye. Thank you, bye. All right.